Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Chess. We are here with one of my favorite chess personalities, a popular chess commentator, streamer, content creator. There are rumors swirling that he's working on a chessable course. Uh, he has served as the manager for his friend, Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana, and was one of the co-hosts of the original chess podcast, The Full English Breakfast. He's also been a guest on Perpetual Chess, my long-form chess podcast. So if you want to hear about this gentleman chasing the Grandmaster title and his other misadventures, I recommend you check that out. But today, of course, we're here to talk chess improvement. Lawrence is going to share a few tips that he has received with us. But first, let's welcome him to the show. Lawrence, what's going on? Wow, that's a nice intro. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, lovely to be here, as always. And I, and I forgot the important uh, tidbit, arch enemy of my friend Greg Shahadi. So hopefully we'll have some time for some uh, hard-hitting trash talk that I know the, the people demand. The people, the people do demand it, and it's just only right. So we have to do the right thing. So. Yes, but we'll uh, we'll save that for the end. We'll start with okay. the chess improvement. So what we're going to discuss, Lawrence, is the three best chess improvement tips you have yeah. received. Of course, you're friends with a lot of uh, big shot chess players in addition to being a big shot commentator yourself. So we're eager to hear some of the advice, even if you didn't follow it. We want to hear at least what you've been told. So you ready to to uh, start yeah, the clock? Yeah, I, I I am. I mean, you, you're going to just fire one, you know, tip number one and that sort of thing, and I'll just I'll just go for it. You know, you're you're a better host than me, Lawrence. I like it. Let's dive into tip number one. Take it away, sir. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I'll give a little bit of context. So many, many years ago, not many, many years ago, sorry, that's an exaggeration. Three or four years ago, I was playing a closed tournament, Grandmaster Closed Tournament in Germany. And I started off horrifically. I started off with, I think it was zero out of four. So I was, sorry, let me just turn that off because that might be interrupting. Apologies. Uh, I started off with zero out of four. And I was at a loss. I didn't know what to do. And I called my good friend, former British champion, Julian Hodgson, Grandmaster Julian Hodgson, one of the greatest attacking players the UK has ever produced. And I said, Julian, I, I'm stuck. I, 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 can't, I can't see anything. I'm getting destroyed by a higher rated, lower It didn't matter who. Help. And this is where the tips come in. And he gave me some really valuable advice. So tip number one is this, is that when you are a chess player and a serious chess player, even if you're an amateur level, but you're a serious player, you know, you're watching the tournaments, you're buying the courses. Ultimately, what you're doing is you're investing in your chess playing. It's more than just a hobby, right? It's, it's, it's more than that for most of us. So basically... You owe it to yourself to when you're in a game of chess to give that period of time, doesn't matter if it's a rapid game or if it's a classical game, 100% of your attention, right? Because you've invested hours, money, mo you know, time into getting better. So in that moment, you've got to think to yourself, wow, I've invested all of this stuff. If I'm just thinking about this, that, and the other, not fully immersing myself in that game, in that moment, I'm actually doing a disservice to myself. I'm actually effectively squandering my investment. And that really hit me because, you know, so often happens when I'm in a game, or at least previously, where my mind would wander. You know, I've got a story to tell you that you won't believe. This is how right. disjointed things were. I swear this is a true story. In the British Championships, probably three or four years ago, around the same time I was playing this tournament, actually, I was doing a lot of crypto trading, right? And I was in such a massive position or leveraged position that during a critical game of this tournament, I went to the arbiter and asked him to check the price <laughs> of Bitcoin. I sh this, is, this is a true story. So this is, when I think back on this, I think this is just the most insane thing ever. Like, what am I doing? Like, how can I play a serious tour? I mean, I'm not playing 1500s here. I'm playing the British Championships. And I've got one eye here and one eye here because I've got such a huge, it's just insane. You've got to have full focus because you owe it to yourself. Okay, you, you owe it, don't do a disservice to yourself. That's tip number one. 
Okay. okay, excellent. Yeah, and I I love that tip because part of the beauty of competitive chess is like you can finally hopefully turn your mind off from whatever like family, financial, relationship, yeah. bitcoin nonsense might be going on <laughs> in your head, but uh the older you get, I think that gets increasingly challenging. So, love that story, Lawrence. Hopefully uh hopefully you you know in markets they say to sell to the sleeping point. So, yeah, you also right. got to you got to sell to the uh Sell to the, you can play a chess game without yeah. thinking about I it. I mean, before. what an insane moment. I mean, <laughs> come on. And I was losing, obviously. It's not that I was win- I was losing, obviously, in that position, right? So that's right. the point, right? Well, yeah, so, of course. I was the wrong okay. side. Okay. Um, All right. You, do you have a number two for us? I do. Me? So it's kind of joined to this, but this is the other thing, right? Even though that last tip sounded quite serious, okay, You've got to also, and this is all from Julian as well, or at least amended slightly from what he said. You've got to also, when you're in a game of chess, it's a stressful occasion for a lot of people. I certainly feel the stress. I don't know if you do, Ben, but when you're in a long play classical tournament and it's silent, people do suffer from it's a, it's it's not the it's 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 tense. The atmosphere is tense. You know, you could be playing a tough opponent. You're you're working hard. Your mind is working, and it's it's hard work. It's 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 really tough. But one thing he said to me was, rather, if you're in a state of mind where you're looking at a game of chess as a chore, in other words, you're in a position. It's complex. You're looking at the variations. It's I can't. Or you either you can't be bothered, or it's too difficult, or etc, etc, and you're making excuses, you're in the wrong frame of mind. What you need to do in a game of chess is to tell yourself, I'm in such a privileged position just to be playing this tournament. Think about all the other things other people in the world are suffering from, whatever. How beautiful it is that you've got the liberty and the opportunity to play a board game that you love right? And that this is actually a, 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 a joyful uh, thing. The, the, the whole process is, is something we, we, we just love the game. We, it's, it's, it should be joyful. So rather than think of it as a chore when you're in the game, tell yourself, oh, actually, do you know what? Buh, 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 line, that's actually quite interesting. Oh, buh, 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 that's actually quite, oh, that's quite curious. When you start looking at it more more from like a curious, interesting, puzzle-like point of view, you start to get even more immersed in the game and you start to find, and this will be point three, I'm coming on to it, you start to find the love for the game, okay? You start to refine your love for the game because a lot of people are at a stage in their career where they've been playing chess for years and you do lose the love slightly and you need a bit of inspiration again. How do you start re-loving the game of chess when you're, you've are you played it for 20, 30 years? Well, it's not at the start because it's exciting and new and whatever, and you're you're on that high ascent and, you know, a lot of people, they, they go up quickly. What if you've been, you've, you've hit a, what if you've hit a plateau? How do you refine that love? And that's a key, that's a key thing to do. And I think you do that by, again, understanding how privileged you are, understanding, how, you know, just look, take a step back, zoom out, think about the history of the game, think about the development of the game, the beautiful things that are going on at the moment, the opportunities you have, the information out there, everything like that. And so, yeah, that's a kind of uh, maybe not a uh, point three on its own, but finding the enjoyment. Enjoy yourself mid-game. Remember, it, yeah, it's difficult, but remember that it's, it's a form of enjoyment. So it's a, it's a pastime for many people. Enjoy the the struggle. Enjoy exactly. the obstacles mid game, right? Rather than yeah, oh, just too hard. It's oh, I can't I can't see. no enjoy that process. And yeah, sorry Ben, you were going to say something. Well, I, well, I've got a follow on because yeah, obviously. Please do. I mean, it's amazing advice and, you know, it is good to take stock of that. And I think everyone feels that way when they come in for the first round, but then chess has a way of beating you down, you know, it does. like, like say, say you have some brutal six hour loss decided by a blunder at the end. Uh, what would uh, Grandmaster Hodgson say at that moment? 
how would you pick yourself up basically yeah. from a from a brutal loss well that's one of the biggest challenges in chess isn't it when you have a brutal long game you're tired afterwards how would you pick yourself up the next day i think again perspective is everything right most people playing these tournaments are not dependent on the result of the next game to survive for their survival the ones that are are the guys that struggle the most and those are the guys who ironically um, do some of the more, let's say, uncouth things in chess. For example, I'm not going to name names, obviously, but for example, what I would classify as the journeyman GM. Okay, so we're talking about the 2500, 24, let's call it 2400 to 2500 grandmasters who literally go and play open tournaments on the continent, mostly in Europe, because in America there isn't really uh, an infrastructure quite for that. Okay, who go around. And they play open tournaments, play little rapid tournaments on the sky side, scraping a few bucks here, a few bucks here, because that is actually how they make a living, right? That's their bread and butter. If they make a thousand euro or a thousand dollar a month or twelve hundred, they can survive, get by, and whatnot. And then, of course, that means that that the result of that game, that next game, actually does make a material difference to their lives. And that's where things like, you know, uh, draws, prearranged draws, throwing games, whatever, have all come in, right? We, the 99% of us, are not in that situation. So when you've suffered a brutal defeat or whatnot, you've got to just give, remind yourself of the perspective. You've just got to say, okay, it's not the end of the world. I'm still going to have a bed tomorrow. I'm still going to be able to eat. Yes, it's hard, but I'm going to pick myself up, try and dust it off. A de detaching the emotion from chess is in, in, impossible because we have this love for the game because it's more than that. Talking about trading and whatever, right? The successful traders, what they do is they detach emotion from their trading and they see it as a numbers game and whatnot. I don't think it's fully possible to do that with chess because it, it's it's chess is a more we, we, it's a more intimate thing in my opinion rather than just numbers and money and whatnot and you just don't care if it goes up or down as long as you made a score chess is something much more we have a much deeper relationship with the game right so i don't think you fully can detach emotion but you can certainly put perspective on the game right i, I mean uh when you think of the top grandmasters that re have got this what the term was bounce back ability if you could uh, put that all as one joined word, bounce back ability. When you think of the top GMs that who have got that, the names that come to mind are Fabiano Caruana, uh, Magnus as well has got huge bounce back ability. Uh, and I'm sure there are others. There are others who suffer more, that's for sure. There are others who, when they start to lose and they lose momentum, it's tough for them to bounce back. But the guys who've got the bounce back ability somehow just manage to kind of say, oh, well, well, OK, yeah, it's gone. It's gone. It's done. It's gone. You can't change it now. Thinking on it forever is, is just it is, there's just no positive uh, um, result for, for, for thinking on it. If you think of the famous GMs that never recovered in history. The big one for me is Bronstein. That's who I was thinking of. Right? Now. Who simply after squandering the World Championship match never ever recovered. What would have happened if he had taken a bit of perspective? Maybe things were different back then as well. The, the political situation was different as well and so on and so forth. But how would he have coped if he had taken a totally different approach to that? Yes, it's like the biggest moment to squander in your career and whatnot. But... Those who, who, who weren't able to bounce back, they they suffered for, for an eternity after. I certainly am guilty, by the way. I hands up. You know, so I've been I've gone to bed that night thinking about games. I've been moody after a game for hours thereafter. But I have noticed that as I got older and I got a slightly wiser and I got a bit more perspective, that that, that period where I'm really upset about a game, it does fade a lot easy, a lot quicker than it used to, for sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's difficult. It's the hardest part 
the mental resilience. It is the hardest part. But again, I think the key to it is perspective on where we're at in all of this, right? So that that would be yeah. my advice. I think someone has That's posted it. a statistical study on Twitter that actually showed that Magnus wins a higher percentage of games coming off a loss than anyone else. So, Well, that doesn't surprise a... me. And also, just talking about that, actually talking about the great man himself, there's something he said at the London Chess Classic years ago when I was commentating there. He was in a totally lost position against Vladimir Kramnik. I mean, stone cold, just finished, right? Like under normal circumstances. And he said something really interesting to me. He said, if you have a position where you're 90, uh, sorry, 1% chance to win or save it, then you should give 99% effort. That wow. kind of formula, right? So that's another thing that I think is really key. You know, we're all going to have losing positions a lot of the time. And what I teach my students as well is, okay, you accept that your position is bad slash losing, make it difficult for your, make him win the game, you know, really make him work for that victory. Because I can tell you this, there's nothing more frustrating than coming up against a guy who's gritty and resilient and he just fails to give up and he finds little resources and he makes your life more difficult. You're just like, oh, won't this guy just roll over already? And you will be surprised how many points you save if you are if you are gritty. And of course, that relates to point one, which is giving it your all during the game, right? Being determined, uh, gi giving full focus. And you'll save points because people get lax. They get complacent when they've got a winning position. And they, again, I can talk from that side. How many positions I've blown winning just from playing any old thing and just thinking I'm just going to cruise through here and I, it doesn't require my attention. It happens it happened all the time. So that's okay. what Magnus cut. And that left a lasting impression on me because I thought, wow, if Magnus is applying that rule against somebody like Vladimir Kramnik, then, you know, then, it, then we should be able to adopt it as well. And we are back. And of course, we ran a little long already because Lawrence has a lifetime worth of stories and great advice. And we're kind of already in listicle format. So I'll keep these uh, bullet points short. Um, number one, I really liked what Lawrence said about using full focus. Um, that's something that, you know, as Lawrence said, um, we're not kids anymore, a lot of us. And when you go to a tournament, it can take a while to get into that sort of mindset where you stop thinking about all the other nonsense going on in your life. But when you do, that's one of the beauties of chess. So it's really important to actively strive for that. And not only does it help your results, but it's just a, a good feeling. Um, number two, what he said about just appreciating how lucky you are to get to play in a chess tournament, uh, advice given from Grandmaster Julian Hodgson was just just amazing because it's true. You know, sometimes the guy next to you or woman, more likely guy, might smell, you know, sometimes like you barely have time to eat. And it's easy to get sort of um, weighed down by these things that are really just trivial in the big picture. And to get to play this beautiful game with uh, centuries of history Um and to sort of uh, apply your craft at whatever, you know, whatever level of com competition you're at, but just to enjoy that struggle is something that that I think keeps all chess players coming back and that all chess players uh, can enjoy. And number three, of course, we got to give a shout out to Magnus Carlsen. Uh, you guys may have heard of the world champion and just an amazing story about the resilience that that he has. And uh, Lawrence, of course, has also seen it firsthand with his friend GM Fabi Fabiano Caruana. So these elite world class players are great exemplars of uh, the way to keep fighting and pose problems for your opponent when you're losing. Um, and um, just just a great lesson to to keep in mind. So excellent stuff, Lawrence. Thanks for the chess tips. You ready to talk some nonsense? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So number one, the, a lot of you may have heard or hopefully heard on Perpetual Chess, we did a special episode called I Am to GM, where Lawrence talked about his lifelong dream of uh, becoming a grandmaster. And that was several months ago. And we're recording this here in mid-September. Um, now, Lawrence, I know that COVID, there's no quitting COVID. It's almost as resilient as Magnus in a losing position, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so is there any update on your Grandmaster title chase? Well, I mean, there's there's no big update, actually, unfortunately. And something else happened since um, uh, our podcast on the Perpetual Chess podcast. I managed to put my passport in the washing machine. <laughs> um, now, uh, 
<laughs> that meant that I was passportless and I was unable to travel. And believe it or not, they don't do a fast track passport if you're British living abroad like you would be in England. So I had to wait 11 weeks for a passport, which is uh, close to three months, um, which is insane. But that's COVID and that's the system. Now you have to apply directly in the UK and wait for it. Um, and I literally got it today. That's no joke. I've got my new blue British non-Euro, non-EU passport. Um, so that means I'm able to play. But of course, that kind of put a stop to my any sort of plans I might have even wanted to have. But in general, I have to say, um, with COVID still lurking, with the fact that over the board tournaments, it's still not clear exactly, uh, you know, regulations are still changing and country dependent. I haven't really got into it just yet. I'm still doing chess. I'm still teaching. I'm still active um, uh, in, in chess, but I haven't properly started my own journey. However, I am still... I mean, fundamentally, uh, this is something I do want to do uh, and, and and get on the horse and, and start studying properly. And I also want to give a shout, a special shout out to somebody. Um, and this is going to this is going to link very nicely to the chessable reveal. Um, the young, very talented and just genuinely top bloke, Ravi Harrier. It's probably a name you don't know, Ben. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Young English I am. He had just, a good result recently, Well, right? he didn't just have one. He had three good results. He did well in the World Cup. He beat Svagnitsev in the first round and got through to round two. He was outrated by 200 yeah. points. Lost in round two, but okay. He then got back-to-back -back GM norms in two close tournaments in the UK. One of which, by the way, I had enrolled for pre-losing my passport in Northumberland. <laughs> so Ravi Harrier is now England's newest GM elect. Needs to get the rating. I think he only needs 15 points or so. Um, and that has inspired me. He's a young guy. I think he's only 22 or 23 years old. Super polite, super nice, fun guy. And Ravi actually uh, was helped me massively with the chessable course. He was actually the main analyst. I've rechecked everything and whatnot and touched up points here, here and there, but it's thanks to Ravi as well that the chessable course is being done and his hard work. So I'm absolutely delighted to say that he's he's been the um yeah the 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 main dude and um you're gonna be hearing a lot more of this guy because he's a fantastic analyst, he's a fantastic player, and uh the future is actually very bright for him in my opinion. I don't know how far he can get as a GM. Uh, I think that's not clear. He's also doing university work and who knows if he'll get a real job in inverted commas, but top guy and congratulations to him and big thanks to him for all his help. Okay. Congrats to Ravi. And are we allowed to say what the topic of the chessboard course that you and Ravi have been working on? I is, mean, Lawrence? I, I don't really know is the honest <laughs> answer. I mean, I am able to say that it is a repertoire okay it's a repertoire from the black side that is going to solve all of your woes and your can like if you if you were looking for a one stop shop repertoire this thing coming out is your solution so okay. you get this and you will be able to play with the black pieces that's what i'm going to be able to say i think that's excellent that's fine I'm and last major topic, um, some of you, those of you on chess Twitter are familiar with uh, Lawrence's ongoing feud with uh, my friend, I am Greg Shahadi, brother of Jen Shahadi. Um, I understand, Lawrence, that you were impressed by recently uh, Chessable posted some pictures of Greg visiting their office. What did you think of that visit there, Lawrence? Yeah, I mean, you know, Greg, uh, what what can we say about the guy? I, he's a fantastic uh, uh, squatter. Uh, he can, he can burpee like nobody I really know, um, that the walking handstands are spectacular and I, I have no idea what was going on him getting the VIP reception at the Chessable office. Let's just remind everybody, this is a guy who has achieved close to zero in the chess world. <laughs> all right. He has 
piggyback the, the Shahadi name thanks to the success of his sister. All right, he's an okay player, he's an IM, and he can, you know, he's using the chessable courses really well, beating a few journeyman grandmasters in the <laughs> title Tuesdays every every week. But apart from that, you know, you go to any... But if I go and open a book in that library I've got here of chess books, you will not find his name, I promise you that. You might find Jen's name, but you won't find him. Don't give this guy the attention he so uh, awfully wants. He is just, uh, you know, uh, he's... he's 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 your cap. He's captain average. You know what? That's the that's what he needs to go and get. He ne- needs to go and next time he visits the the chessable office, you know, welcome him when putting a little badge on his tank top and it, or you know because you can't put it on his sleeve or or his shirt. He doesn't wear doesn't wear any clothes. <laughs> walks around in a tank top twenty four seven. Right. So find that little piece of material that the you know that he barely has on his body and put. Captain Average, because that's what he oh, is. Right. All right. No, I love you, Greg. Really. No, he's actually he's actually quite a good player. Actually, true story. Been quite impressed with his improvement, Greg. And um, I will say this: I don't know if this is going to get out on the main streets, but it's time for me and you to to complete the trilogy. It's Uh-oh. time for me and you because look, let's face it: you swindled me in two matches, um, and all good uh, rivalries have a trilogy. If you think of all the great boxing matches and anything else, I'm down if you are. Uh, anytime, any place, anywhere, I'm ready to get it on and prove to the world. You can beat me by two points here and two points there. Swindle me a rook down, blah, blah, blah. Let's have it right. Let's get a clear cut winner. No discussions and settle this once and for all all right excellent all right and shout out to greg of course great guy uh sharp guy. player jokes great aside guy. um but great we'd like guy. to keep the rivalry going um and would love to see a match all right well lawrence uh great tips um and looking forward to the secret chessable course once all can be revealed so thanks as always thank for, you uh, so much us. Ben. thanks appreciate it <laughs>